I'm Kurt Anstreicher. Uh, it's October 30th, 2019. Uh, we're here today in Iowa City uh, with Tim Lau, a longtime faculty member at the University of Iowa, an INFORMS fellow. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, Tim's life and work in the field of OR. So to start, Tim, uh, can you tell us a bit about your family background? Where were you born and where did you grow up? Yes, I, <clears throat> I was born in uh, Marshalltown, Iowa, which is in the middle of the state, a uh, town of about 20,000 people. One of the, I think one of the uh, good things about Marshalltown, there were a lot of good things, but one of the things that I said was really important to me uh, was great educational system. You know, the great school, the high school, it was, it was terrific. And uh, tell us about your family, uh, your parents, siblings. Sure. Okay, um, two brothers, um, an older brother who uh, was an engineer, trained as an engineer, got an MBA, in fact, here at the University of Iowa, uh, worked as a controller for a major company, uh, passed away early, unfortunately. Uh, Roger, Roger passed away. Uh, younger brother, um, two years younger than me, also a, a faculty guy. Uh, he, was a, he was a biologist, is a biologist, in fact, a PhD biology. He, um, he's retired, but he continues to work. You know, he's one of these people that he's retired, but he doesn't get paid. Although he does, uh, he does get work on grants. He, he, every summer he teaches a course up in northern Michigan. Uh, it's a field course. And it's his favorite thing to do because he likes to slosh around, you know, he's, a, he's like a marine biologist. He's always looking, you know, wading around somewhere looking for little two-celled uh, animals, which are called diatoms. So he's in, you know, he's in hog heaven up there when he gets a <laughs> chance to do that. Uh, our parents, my father um, was a, he's passed away, lost, we lost both mom and dad. Uh, my father <clears throat> was a supervisor for a utility company um, and a very handy guy. He, uh, extremely handy guy. He, um, I think the amazing thing about it, and I, I don't know too many parents that do this, but he actually built our house himself uh, with friends from, from work. I, I remember when, you know, we were renting, renting a home on the, sort of on the north side of Marshalltown. And I remember he'd take, you know, the three boys with him uh, over to the, where the new house was going to be. You know, and he leased a, a, a bulldozer and he dug the hole for the basement. And then, they, you know, he laid the block. Uh, then he framed the house. He did the plumbing himself, you know, with friends. And then he did the electrical. I mean, he did the house. I mean, I don't, I don't know if people do that anymore, but he, he was an amazing, amazing guy. And one of the <laughs> nice things about his job, and this, this will come up later as, as we talk about some of my hobbies, I guess we're gonna do that at the tail end, but he, uh, as I said, he worked for this utility. And uh, at the utility, where they, they have these thing called line trucks. These are the trucks with the you know, they got a boom on the front and, you know, the linemen go out and they climb up a pole and fix, you know, fix wires or whatever. Well, where they kept the line trucks, um, they also worked on the line trucks there. So they had, um, and they would allow the employees to come and use the garage. So, you know, if something was broken down, we would take the car down there and they had, you know, a pit, you know, a pit where you pull the boards out and you get under the car without lifting it. They had a lift, they had you know, parts washers, they had tools of all sorts. And for us that was important because you know, the family car, things would go bad, but three boys with these old cars that we used to drive, there was always something to need work. So it seemed like you know, every week we were down there, down there working, on, uh, working on, on, the, on the car. Now my mother, my mother was a school teacher, uh, not practicing school teacher when you know we got a little older she stayed home to take care of the kids but that's she was the person who really drilled the importance of education into the boys I mean it was it was almost over the top I mean we were 
we were willing people. You know, we were interested in school. We liked to go to school. And <clears throat> one of the sort of one of the sort of funny, th I think, a funny thing is a lot of my classmates would get. You know, if they get an A, they get twenty-five cents. They get a reward at home. So I can remember coming home and whining about that to my mother. I said, come on, everybody else is getting 25 cents for an age. We're not going to do that. You know, so instead she would re reward us with, you know, an attaboy, pat on the back, and then make a cake for us or something. But, you know, it was really, it was really important. To, I, if I think back about that, it was really important to sort of drill into our heads, you know, the importance of education and you don't do it for financial rewards. You do it for for life. You're doing stuff to prepare prepare you for life. Um, so that's pretty much my uh, my sort of my hometown and the sorts of things that that were going on there. So I know you went to school in Marshalltown. Um, what subjects were you good at or interested in in school? Well, that's actually two different questions. <laughs> so, well. <laughs> But and I and I and I phrase it that way. I I, I really enjoyed uh, mathematics. Um, I enjoyed we had a course in physics. I didn't do so well in physics, but I liked it. I liked it because it, you know it involves mathematics. Chemistry I liked. I liked the chemistry course. Um, so that's uh, that's those are the really sort of the courses that I that I really enjoyed. And I think it. It sort of prepared me for the next leap forward, I guess. So was there anything in school that you think uh, influenced your eventual choice to work in OR? Well, okay, so the way I guess I would answer that is um, in high school, no, because I didn't know anything about OR. I didn't even know what the name was. But um, I liked puzzles. I liked, uh, and I always tell, you know, when I, when I want to talk about a puzzle, I talk about the one, sort of the classic, where, you know, train A is here and train B is here, and there's, you know, a track between them. This train travels at 75 miles an hour, and this one travels at 60 miles an hour, and then the question is, they're 100, they're 100 miles apart, where do they meet and what time is it? Well, you know, I mean, that's a classic sort of puzzle. And I, I was always fascinated by those. And I always, you know, there's this book by Martin Gardner of uh, mathematical puzzles. I have that book at home. I, I think if I would have had that as a kid, uh, and they're difficult. Some of those are difficult questions, but I know I would have been entranced by by looking looking through that book as a, as a kid. So moving on to uh, college, uh, where did you go to college, and what did you study? Okay, I was I went to Iowa State University in Ames. So that's for those of you who know that, and there may not be many that know the geography of Iowa, but uh, I do, and you do now, and you guys do. Um, about thirty-five miles west of of Marshalltown, um, I primarily went there. I guess yeah, like a primary reason I went. First of all, I wanted to be in engineering. Uh, I just thought. You know, given my interests, I liked mechanical things. I liked, I liked mathematics. Um, I liked, I thought I liked at least sort of the economic part of things, which you certainly get in industrial engineering. My brother went there for one thing, so it's one of those. My older brother, so it's one of those things. Well, okay, he wanted to be an engineer. He went to Iowa State, thirty-five miles away. Why don't I do the same thing? So I went there um, with that reason, that, that in mind. Also, I, I was actually had a, a, a varsity basketball scholarship there because in high school we had won the, we had won the state basketball tournament um, the previous year, and I was fortunate enough to have gotten the basketball scholarship, so, um, which paid, me way through, paid my way through college, which was nice. Um, that was the only place, only place I ever even, you know, had a, had a shot at a scholarship. So that, that was, that was, those were the reasons. I'm glad I went there. I mean, I've, it set me off on a lot of things that I've done since then. And then uh, where did you go to graduate school? 
Oh, I went to graduate school at uh, Northwestern, and um, I should say probably, should back up just a little bit on, on why I went to Northwestern. Well, I got interested in operations research at Iowa State, and uh, you know, I, like I said, I hadn't heard anything about it at, in high school, but in college, well, first of all, the, the industrial engineering department at, at Iowa State was very traditional, very traditional uh, IE program. Most, you know, very little OR was going on then. Of course, or, OR was pretty new back then too, I think. But I had taken a course, uh, it was a, you know, sort of a survey of operations research, like, you know, just sort of a fundamentals of operations research. And I remember we solved a linear programming problem, a graphical two-dimensional problem, you know, using contour lines. Um, and, you know, that's great. Gee, we can do that, but, you know, what do we do if we've got, what do we do if we've got 16 variables? How, how can we do that? So I talked to the instructor, who was an industrial engineering uh, faculty member, and he said, well, you're going to have to go across the street. So I went over to the Ag Econ department and took a course on linear programming. And I remember sitting in that class, and it was a classroom where they had blackboards all the way around the room. You know, start here, and it goes all the way around, you know, blackboard after blackboard. And start the class, you'd have a linear programming problem. And then every time there was a pivot, <laughs> In linear programming, you'd have to rewrite, rewrite the matrix. So pivot, 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 and by the time after 45 minutes, you got this notebook full of matrices. And I thought, well, that's clever, but I don't have enough paper to solve real problems this way. So there must be a better way to do it. But it was to me, it was fascinating. It was very fascinating to. That's the first time I had seen. Anybody, I'd heard about the simplex method, but I've never seen anybody actually use it until I went to that Ag Econ course. But believe it or not, that got me excited about it. And eventually ended up at Northwestern because of that. That's a great story. I, I like the one pivot per blackboard. <laughs> drive you crazy. So could you tell us a bit about some of the faculty that you met at Northwestern? Well, uh, first of all, I, you know, I worked um, with uh, Arthur Herter, who was the, actually the chairman of the department. He, I chose him as my advisor because he was a mathematical economist. And I really, I think what I wanted to do when I went there is I wanted to tie, somehow tie economic concepts more closely with what was going on in operations research. And that was, that was a good, that was a good thing for me in terms of how it eventually turned out and in terms of what I did. Good technical faculty there. I, I think it, you know, the, the faculty we had at Northwestern at that time were terrific. There was uh, Erhan Chenlar, who in stochastic processes, who you know, eventually moved on to, I think he's at Princeton now. Bill Perscala was on the faculty. Uh, Elmore Peterson in, in mathematical programming. Uh, Bob Robert Rosenthal, who was in game theory at that time, so you know, it was great. It was just a great experience. Um, they uh, they were really, really, really good. Um, I think one of the nice things for me in terms of exposure to these people, besides the faculty that were there uh, on, in the program, I was very fortunate. I was asked to be the student host for the seminar series. So we would have a lot of people coming in to give seminars, you know, well-known people in operations research. And, you know, you have to have a student gopher. And that was basically me for two years. And I didn't mind because it was a great opportunity to meet some of these people, you know, over time. And, you know, get to know them. And, you know, maybe they'd remember me a little bit later on. And that actually turn out to be the case because, um, you know, having made those initial contacts will, first of all, just good exposure, period, to be, be around them as, mu as much as, as possible. So that was, to me, that was a real plus of my, of my, grad, of my graduate days. So you mentioned that uh, Art Herter was your advisor. Uh, yeah. What was your thesis on? 
Uh, my thesis was, uh, the title of my thesis was called The Market Area Problem. And again, that sort of, that ties together sort of the OR stuff and, and, and economics, uh, economics and regional economics actually, because it was a, it was a problem involving, you know, manufacturing facilities where they incur transportation costs to move material from the site of where they're being manufactured up to the customer base. There were production cost functions. And the idea is you've got this massive problem, it was a messy problem as well as massive, where you're dealing with, you know, locating facilities and figuring out which customers are served by which people. Um, but it, it, was, it was a valuable experience for me because it was sort of my first look at location problems, which I eventually started doing more work in as I, as I moved through my career. So how did you come to pick that problem? Good question. When your advisor says, this is a good one to work on, <laughs> that's not a bad idea to do that. Um, you know, one of the things I think, Kurt, I, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate this too, you know, as a, or maybe you remember uh, your graduate days, but you're sort of stumbling around trying to figure out, well, what, you know, what can I do for a topic? I, it's got to be good or they're not going to let me out of here. And I have to work with somebody I can get along with. And, you know, some of these people you've had a class from and some you haven't. So how do you, that's a tough problem for, for graduate students. And, that, you know, I guess I solved it by asking him one day, well, what's interesting here? And he pointed this one out and I sort of, I sort of took off there. So there was, he was, that's, that's a topic that he was interested in. He, in fact, he'd written a book. Um, he'd actually co-authored a book on in, with covering some of the materials that, that uh, we were dealing with in that in that uh, dissertation, but also on the Northwestern campus, uh, uh, Leon Moses, who had, was a longtime Northwestern um, faculty member. He was in economics and at the transportation system, uh, they, they a transportation center. They had a center for research at uh, Northwestern. I think they still do. And I think it might be in the civil engineering department, in fact. But um, Leon Moses, you know, was involved with that and with that center as well as being in an economics. And then I remember taking a course from him, too. So he was on my committee. Uh, the reason, you know, partial of the reason, part of the reason I guess I took that, picked that topic is because of the course that I took from him. So um, did your thesis work have much influence on your subsequent research in OR? A lot. A lot. Because, you know, my early career, um, I did a lot of work in location theory. And it, act, it actually had a lot to do with where I took my first job. Um, Nick Francis is somebody that I've co-authored, you know, been a co-author on a lot of my early work. In fact, on my work until up a few years ago when, when Dick, uh, Dick, you know, retired. So Dick was at the University of Florida and um, that was sort of what attracted me to go to the University of Florida. That was actually my first, uh, my first teaching job. So you mentioned uh, your advisor, Art Herder, mm -hmm. and of course, Dick Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, who are some other people that were early mentors in your career? Well, you know, besides the I guess mentors in my career, uh, I would have to say you know, some of these folks that were at Northwestern, but also I think that the people at, at, the, at the University of Florida, because that's sort of where, that's where you're getting started, right? And they talk to you about, here's what you need to do, you know, you got to work hard, you got to do this, you got to do that, you want to get, you know, if you want to advance in this business, you have to do this. So Mike Thomas, uh, Mike was the department chair there, and he was a Hopkins PhD, and I think his, I think, his, who was his advisor? Um, I can't remember. Anyway, well known, I guess. Uh, and he was well known. But Mike was the, uh, Mark was the chairman. Don Ratliff was there. Um, Don, you know, was um, eventually moved to Georgia Tech. And he is still, I think, associated with Georgia Tech. Donald Hearn 
as a mathematical programmer. Uh, by the way, all these, uh, it, with the exception of Thomas, these are people that I've actually co-authored at least one paper with. Um, now, the, uh, also Tom Hodgson was there. Tom, uh, Tom does work in um, more production, uh, production work, scheduling, and these kinds of things. Um, I have not co-authored with him. I'm trying to think. No, I'm not. But he's a good guy. Anyway, they were. I would call them my mentors because, you know, you walk in the door, you don't know anything, you don't know what the game is. You've been told back by your advisor, but now you're on your own, and you know, just to see how they do their work. How do they? You know, they look like they're working. They and they were working. People were in their offices working and say, well, gee, maybe that's what you have to do. Spending time with them, going to seminars, you know, with them, and listening to their questions, and those are the sorts of things that I think uh, really are important for a young person to get to get started in this business. So you mentioned your first academic mm -hmm. position was in mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a bit about your employment history. So can you talk about the different places where you worked and the work that you did? Yes, be glad to. I've been I'm using the moving van several times here. Uh, University of Florida, as I mentioned, uh, we were there for five years. This was the engineering department. So PhD in engineering, but operations research focus. Went to an industrial engineering, part, engineering department, University of Florida, which had some traditional IE, but there was a lot of, a lot of what I would call OR work going on there as well. Um, after five years, um, Moved to had the opportunity to move to Purdue University. I think I mentioned that you know even as a grad student, I was really interested in more not just mathematical programming, but sort of connecting it with economics and these sorts of things. And going to a business school that sort of that seemed to be what I should be doing, sort of short term at least. So fortunate to get an appointment in the business school at 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 Purdue, and that business school, by the way, at the time at least, and I think it's still true, was about as quantitative as you could ask for because their graduate program, they used to give it, at that time they were giving a, it's called a Master of Science in Industrial Administration, MSIA, and when they started that master's program, they, um, that was primarily for Purdue engineers, and there are a lot of Purdue engineers, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's one of the biggest uh, number of alumni in, in engineering in the country. The idea was to have the engineers come back, get a business degree in, I think it was like a 15-month degree. So the emphasis not, was more than technical, but they, these engineers weren't afraid of numbers written on the board. So it, it, it was a very, it was a pretty technical. Um, business school it seemed like a, that would be a good transition for me coming out of coming out of engineering to move into that kind of a business school but i also had a a courtesy appointment in the ie department because i i noticed that i'd come from engineering and i knew some people over there and they wanted to make a connection between the two uh, uh between the two departments so that was that was a good a good match for me um so there I spent, what, 11 years, I guess, at, uh, at the Craner School. Uh, some of the people that were there, um, Gordon Wright was there. Actually, Gordy Wright was on the faculty at Northwestern. In fact, he was recruiting grad students to Northwestern. He called me and you know, convinced me to go to Northwestern, and I show up, and he's gone. You know, he, he, was, then at, he was then at Craner. So... You know, that I knew him because of the conversations I'd had with him, but, you know, that's how people move around in this business. Um, other people that I worked with, Bob Plant, uh, which I will talk more about later on. Um, uh, Herb Moskowitz was there. Uh, Lee Shores in, is, was in the operations management area. Uh, Richard Wong. Rich was a student of Tom Magnanti's. That was his advisor, and, and uh, worked with some with Rich. And again, many of those people I've done some co-authored work with. That was a good stay for us. So 11 years there, 
you know, our, ki our, our kids essentially grew up in, in West Lafayette and, you know, there's still strong connections with people there. Then, let's see, went to the University of Iowa and two years before my good friend and colleague Kurt came to the University of Iowa. And we've both been there, well, getting close to 30 years now, right? And the people there, of course, Kurt, is, you know, first person I should mention of, of people to, in terms of the quality of the faculty we have there. Uh, Ken Kortanik was on our faculty when I came here. Ken has retired um, and still has contact with us. Uh, Yin Yu Ye, who was here, we overlapped, I guess, in maybe four or five years, and then he moved on to, to Stanford. Um, who am I missing here? Uh, Ann Campbell, Barry Thomas. Yeah, well, yeah, the new, sorry. The young Important people. Important people. These are the young people. Ann Campbell, terrific uh, person. She's, she's very interested in operations management. Um, she came out of Georgia Tech. Uh, Barry uh, Thomas, who came out of the IE department at, um, at Michigan, who's now doing uh, great work, and he's also the current department chair. So, you know, things roll through time, and you know, the young people are now doing the kinds of things that we did when we were a little younger. We're still doing. We're still trying to work, of course. But uh, <laughs> so I think you were at Penn State for one year. Oh yeah, too. Penn State. Yeah, I went to one year and one year to Penn State. Uh, and then um, you, that's a that's a, all your academic mm -hmm. positions. But I think in the early years you actually uh, had some non-academic positions that had provided you some interesting experiences. Yeah, yeah. I uh, okay. Right out of okay. So there's this there's the undergraduate right, and then there's the graduate work at Northwestern. But in between, um, when I finished at Iowa State, um, I, first of all, I had gone through Army ROTC, you know, so then you're, you're obligated for a couple of years as, a, as an officer. This was during the Vietnam War time. Uh, so I went to work for Exxon. I was a process engineer at a refinery in, in Louisiana. Um, so eventually I you know, was called up to go uh, to service for, for my two-year stint. Um, I had the good fortune, as it turned out, to have taught um, Fortran 4 programming at Iowa State as an undergrad. Now this was sort of unusual. I guess I, I did have a good record and I guess they recognized that and they were short on faculty so you know I ended up teaching Fortran 4 programming at least one quarter well in the quarter system back then and that was fortunate for for actually for a couple of reasons that I'll get into here in a second but uh, first the first thing that, that was important for, in terms of my career and what I did uh, ultimately in the army is I worked in in data processing and remember, this is during the Vietnam War, so they were short on people that knew anything about uh, computers and computer programming. So they cut my orders for Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and I worked for uh, a department there, it was called the uh, Army Personnel Reporting System, Army Personnel Reporting System. So that, that outfit kept track of Army personnel, wherever they were, they, there was, you know, there was a, a data record on, on, on every individual. And the data record contained all the information about, you know, basically their, their life uh, in the service. Um, things like where were they stationed last, how long were they at this, at, at this assignment, and so forth. So that was good. I, I didn't actually do any programming, although I learned machine language at that time, just, just sort of survival, because, um, you know, we had, we had people that were doing the coding there, because what they're doing, the coding they were doing is they're rewriting the programs to be used in this Army Personnel Reporting System. Now, computers back then, um, you know, the big massive things with tape drives and all this, you've probably seen the, you've probably seen the pictures of it, but um, it turns out that a, an incident happened that 
was sort of a career, a, a mind changer for me. And this is, I think this is an interesting story. I, I, I think about this a lot. Um, okay, so I'm downtown Washington, D.C. with, you know, a bunch of GIs, our Army people, and we're, we're in this ground floor of this building, an office building. Big glass window that looks out on the street. I think it was out on M, M Street, or I think it was M Street. Anyway, it's one of the downtown Washington, D.C. streets. Uh, so we're working away. They're, you know, mounting the tapes up on the machine. I'm watching, <laughs> trying to help a little bit. And I heard this tap on the window. There was a tap. Somebody knocking on the window. It's out on the sidewalk. And I looked. I was there, and I, this, there was this person. And he points for the door. The door's down, you know. Just, it's a big room we're in, but the door is down there to get to go out on the sidewalk. He points down there. I said, oh, okay. So I opened the door, and he came in, and he stared at me, and he said, you don't recognize me, do you? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> what did I do here? What could possibly have happened here? He said, well, okay, I want you to remember one thing. He said, I was at Iowa State as a freshman taking this engineering programming course. You were the instructor. I thought, oh, okay, what's he going to say? Because <laughs> I still don't remember. But he said, you know, I almost failed. I almost flunked out of school. He said, but I came to see you several times. You encouraged me to stay in the program. You encouraged me to finish the course and stay f until you graduate. And he said, he said this, thanks to you, I stayed in school. And I I thank you very much. He shook my hand and he walked out. And that was sort of an epiphany for me. And I thought, you know what? That must be maybe what I should be doing the rest of my life. I didn't immediately go back to graduate school from that incident, but I certainly, I can still remember it today. I remember the, the incident today. So whatever that means, it was a signal for me to go do this. Uh, once I got out of the service, um, I went back to Exxon. Because remember, I started at Exxon, went to the service, went back to Exxon, and uh, worked about one more year. And I kept talking to my wife about, gee, you know, I kind of liked the academic life. I liked learning. Uh, I didn't know what research was at that point, never did any. Um, but I, I relayed the incident to her several times about this person who said, you know, maybe you've done a good job, you saved me. That, that's a little strong, but that's more or less what he w was saying. And she said, okay, I don't want to hear any more about it. You either go right back now or don't talk about it again. So pulled up roots, loaded the furniture in, the, in a U-Haul. We had one child at that time, took off for Evanston from Louisiana, from Evanston, Illinois, and that's when I started my graduate work. So you've had a long career at uh, many institutions. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the role of OR has changed uh, throughout your career? Sure. I think, um, I think what's happened is, you know, when you think about uh, how OR started, you know, think back. Uh, long ago where uh, term operations research even was coined by someone. I think some of that started up in the war effort in World War II. They were, you know, they were concerned about things like, you know, tracking with submarines or something. It was, you know, these search routines that, that all started there. So, you know, that was originally driven by problems, right? That's, that's where it first started driven by problems. And, and, and then what sort of happened as it evolved over time, there was, you know, the subset of the operations research people were more driven by, let's say, algorithms as opposed to, even though the algorithms ultimately used in the problems, they sort of, they got separated from, from, from the problems. Some people, not, not us, but, you know, some people look at it that way. But I think what's happened now, it's sort of turned back again, and now things are problem-driven again. I mean, I t you take some of the, the classical journals, like, you know, management science in particular. 
you know, in the old days you could you could publish you know an algorithm in management science. Now you have to have a problem. It has to be driven by a problem. So uh, you know, sort of this evolution. Um, I said the second thing I think that you know the the um, the data processing community has had a tremendous influence now on operations research because now you know these things are being developed on on the computer now that you can actually use the, use these algorithms to solve big problems instead of using a room full of blackboards like I talked about with with my example my first example of OR uh, of linear programming so I think that's part of the evolution is just back to emphasis again not not emphasis but sort of a requirement to tie it into where it, where it's really needed that that's my personal viewpoint um, but that's what you asked for so <laughs> so uh, you have a long publication record uh, what I'd like to do next is talk about a few of the papers uh, that you wrote that have been the most influential and uh, for each of these, mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit about the history and your sure. collaborators. Uh, and these are in chronological order. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first one is uh, convex location problems on tree networks. That was in uh, OR in 1976. Right. Okay, that paper, well, first of all, let me just sort of say what was going on in location theory at that time. That was, you know, in the 70s. It was, remember, I started my job in 73, and that's in 76. I got very interested in, as I said, I, I went to Florida primarily because, you know, it's a good place, but secondly, Dick Francis was there. So uh, we started doing, and observing and doing work on location on networks. Because you could do location in the plane and, you know, in three-dimensional space, but we got interested in location on networks. And it turned out that uh, on general networks, several of the sort of classical problems in location theory, like the um, multi-facility, where you're minimizing the sum of costs, the other one is where you're minimizing the maximum cost, um, are difficult to solve, very difficult to solve, on a general network. And part of the reason for that is you've got alternative routes to get from one point to another. Uh, on the other hand, on a tree network, there's, a, there's a, one simple path between any two points. And by simple, I mean a non-simple path would be you go here, up, back again, and then keep going. That's a non-simple non path. Simple path is you never backtrack anywhere. But there's only one. Okay, that seems reasonable. That would say that, gee, that ought to make the problems easier. And it does on many of these classical problems to solve the location of where you put something relative to existing things. Um, but what we were interested in is, gee, can we tie that into these general concepts that you oftentimes see in, in, in mathematical programming, like convexity, convex sets, you know, sort of a classical uh, feature of a set of points. Is, you know, line connecting any two stays in the set. You take any two in there and the line between them stays in the set. Uh, convex functions. If you're minimizing, you'd like to have it go like this, the function, because then if you find a local minimum, you know, an area where you move the left or the right, you're going to go uphill. The convex function, a local minimum is a global minimum. So, and that seemed to be, makes sense on the terms of, of what's going on in these network location problems on trees. So what we did is we just jet, sort of derived these concepts of convex sets, convex functions, and all the associated features that go with those um, when the network is a tree. And uh, it got published in, I remember George Nemhauser was the, the editor and he loved that paper said, hey, we got to have this paper. So uh, we published it there. It's a, it's a paper that has had a lot of sites. Uh, you know, now it's, I think people, I mean, I think everybody pretty much knew that these problems were a lot easier on tree networks, but never, there was never any way of sort of generalizing it. And I think that's what we were after. It was a generalization of that, of that work. 
So uh, the next paper uh, is one of my personal favorites, uh, the product matrix traveling salesman problem, uh, an application and solution heuristic. So this appeared in Operations Research in 1987. Okay. Okay, good story on this one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at Purdue, that's my, uh, my second stop on this train of places I've been. Um, Bob Plant, who I mentioned earlier is one of the people there. Uh, Bob Plant, uh, he's originally from Connecticut. He'd been on, you know, he'd been on the faculty and we got to know each other because he was interested in OR kind of stuff. One day he started talking about this, this problem. Um, the problem was uh, when you rebuild a jet engine, jet engine, you know, like a Pratt & Whitney, you know, Pratt & Whitney is one of the manufacturers that makes these big jet engines, you know, that go on like commercial airliners. Um, these engines have to, gen, excuse me, the engines have to be torn down after a certain number of flight time, not years, but months or hours. They're torn down and then they have to rebuild the engine. Well, one of the features in the engine is, first of all, is a turbine. Because, you know, hot gases flow through and they drive a turbine and the turbine then drives the compressor, which, you know, creates more compressed air combined with fuel that blows out the back end and that's how you get your power. Um, so, in that stage of the engine, actually there are multiple stages where this, this happens, there, uh, the hot gases go through, uh, these are concentric, think of concentric rings, small ring, big ring, and the area between the rings, that's where the gases flow through, and then they impinge on this, the rotor, this, like a propeller, they impinge on that which drives the turbine. Well, to distribute the gases in a uniform way around this, I guess it would be called the annulus between the two, these two rings, this area between, what you, <clears throat> what you want to have is uniform flow. Anywhere you look on that 360 degrees, you want to have uni uniform flow of these hot gases going through because otherwise you get things like, uh, you know, you get bearing wear because you've got a, you know, you've got a big shot here and not much here and so you get wobbling and all this other stuff. So the idea is to somehow figure out how to uniformly distribute the hot gases going through. Well, to help distribute the hot gases, they put in uh, what are called guide vanes, which are just, you know, it looks like this, it's a, but it's a piece of metal, right? It's bolted in and it has a convex side, I guess I'll call this, the concave side and the convex side. So they're adjacent like this, but they're featured around, the, around this ring. So, what do we mean by uniform flow? And how does the flow change? How does that area between them change? Well, if you put a new vein in, it doesn't have the same characteristics of what you took out. Secondly, some of these veins can be resurfaced, even though they're maybe scorched a little bit <laughs> because of the hot gases, they can be resurfaced. But when they're resurfaced, also their configuration changes. So, um, you're stuck with this issue about uh, uniform, you know, uniform flow. Well, Bob's, going back to Bob Plant, Bob Plant, my colleague, his father worked for uh, a company, I think it's a Sterrett company in uh, Massachusetts, somewhere, Massachusetts or somewhere on the East Coast. You're from the East Coast, you probably yeah. know what I'm talking about. Okay, so... <laughs> um, <clears throat> and his father had developed this instrument uh, to, in fact, I think he, he actually patented it, where um, what you can do is you can put a single vein, put a single vein in this instrument, and it takes a measurement on this side and a measurement on this side. So you got, think of it as this is A and this is B, A side and B side. Then, if you had that measurement on all of, the, all of the veins as they go around the circumference, the area between them is the A of this side plus the B of this. So you got A plus B, A plus B as the areas around. But there's a different A and a different B for every, everything in between. 
Okay, so that helps you, right? I mean, now we got some, we're starting to get some structure because we've got this instrument that we didn't have before. Um, okay, so then we thought about what does that mean in terms of uniformity? Well, we thought, okay, why don't we look at the variance? Why don't we look at the variance uh, as measured when it, and given any configuration? The variance, uh, you know, there's some sort of some average value and then the variance would be the deviation from that average. So variance says you square things, right? So we end up squaring A plus B, and what drops out are some things that'll be constant, independent of any build, and then A times B is what's left. That's what's unique about, you know, putting this thing here or this thing here. So we've taken this, this seemingly crazy problem, sort of a ge geography pro a geographical problem, and we turn it into uh, a problem of like a traveling salesman, basically a traveling salesman problem around the circumference, but where the cost terms between adjacent quote cities, and the cities in this case are adjacent veins, that cost term is a a times B, A of this and B of this, A times B. Well, that's a, that's a special kind of uh, coefficient ma uh, matrix that you end up with. It's called a product, product matrix because it's a product of A and a product of B. <clears throat> well, it turns out that you can then solve a, an assignment problem. <laughs> solve an assignment problem, and if you're lucky to get a tour with the assignment problem, then you're done. And the assignment problem is all very easily because it's rank one matrix in decreasing order and the other in increasing order and pair them up that way. You're lucky if you ever get a, a single tour. If you don't get a single tour, then you can show that a patching algorithm would work quite well on this meaning if I patch these two circles together, I break this and I break this and I link them together, like that. So anyway, the patching algorithm works very well for this problem and we were able to establish upper and lower bounds on the quality of the build that we get, which was great. This was a product that was actually used uh, for a while at least. I remember we took it, uh, this, the algorithm, I should say, it runs very fast. Um, we actually took a trip to <laughs> Pittsburgh to one of the uh, airline rehab facilities where they actually break down the engines. We watched them use, use this uh, instrument. Um, that was a fun, fun project. And, a, and the reason it was a fun project is it was an interesting problem to begin with. It had, I think, sort of a clever solution. And it was a real problem. I mean, what? What more can you ask for? <laughs> um, anyway, that was a that was a fun that was a fun project, and of course it solved. Well, I mean, we're talking about a, maybe a hundred at maximum hundred number of cities in a traveling salesman problem. The technology at that point is not what it is today. I mean, no one would use this today because the improvement in traveling salesman algorithms is such that this would be no problem to solve it exactly. All right, both of those papers involved uh, networks in one form or another. Yes. Um, the third paper is an operations paper, uh, Rationalizing Tool Selection in a Flexible Manufacturing System for Sheet Metal Products. Uh, that appeared in OR in 1990, and um, at least the topic doesn't seem to involve networks. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, okay. So again, just sort of the backstory a little bit on this one. Mark Daskin and Phil Jones were both at Northwestern at that time, and I was at, at Purdue at the time. Uh, I went to Northwestern to give a seminar. Uh, after the seminar, we were sort of talking about things they're working on. Um, they brought up this problem where uh, a company, if it's producing uh, sheet metal products, uh, might be the, you know, the side of a, a transmission. The transmission needs to have some holes in it because you got stuff going through. Um, the, probably most of the technology at that point was to create a die, a single die, you know, that would stamp out exactly what you needed. Well, the problem with uh, 
you know, dye technology is when the design changes, you got to go get a new new dye made, which you know basically will do everything in one hit like that. But if you change the product, the dye isn't any good anymore. So the alternative is to punch holes one at a time, and there you would use a tool, you'd use a magazine. A magazine would hold the, the punches, extract, punch, put it back, pick out a new one, and punch, you know, sort of an, in an automated fashion. Well, the problem there is that you've got a lot of different holes that you need to have punched, and you've got a lot of different tools. Uh, the t tool magazine has a capacity you've got to worry about. Um, but the, the basic problem is, you know, each hole has a certain sort of nominal um, diameter, but then it has a plus and minus tolerance that the user is willing to live with. You know, you say, well, I want the hole to be half, half an inch nominally, but I could take, you know, two thousandths this way or two thousandths this way is sort of a little bit of slop in there. You know, what we could live with that. Tools, on the other hand, a punch, will punch, you know, as it wears down, as it wears down, its, it's diameter that it's going to punch is going to wear down. So also there's some, you know, manuf manufacturing tolerances in, in creating these punches. So the big problem here is, will this tool punch this hole? Well, it has to be able to fit, it has to be able to fit in that hole, you know, but plus the plus and minus tolerances as well. Well, if you think about it, a hole is basically one, dim is one dimension, right, that, that describes a hole, and that's the diameter. I mean, it's round. You, you can't say the same thing with a rectangle, but you can with a, with, with, a, with a circle. So the problem essentially reduces to, think about a line where you have intervals on the line. Think about those as being the diameters of the holes that you want punched. The tools then will take up a line segment as well, as when it, if you think about punching through the line, then the question is, do these, do, the, do these intervals, the whole intervals, are they covered by the tool intervals? And that turns out to be a location problem, a special kind of location problem, where you're locating, it's a covering problem, and here you're covering a line with another line or a gap, you know, an interval, cover an interval with another interval. And after talking with these guys about this problem, and I thought about it for a while and started to write things down, I recognized, well, that's a classical location problem, right? You're locating coverage. It's a coverage problem. And it turns out it's a special kind of coverage problem uh, called a totally balanced zero-one matrix is a covering matrix. And again, those are quite easily solved, relatively easily solved. That, so that's, that's another example of a real problem. At least I was told it was a real problem. These guys, they're the ones that have gone out and talked to the manufacturers. I had not done this, but you know, then you've got an interesting, interesting algorithm to solve. Okay, the next paper definitely involves a real problem. This is a problem with a nice Iowa connection. Uh, the paper was managing the seed corn supply chain at Syngenta that appeared in Interfaces in 2003. Okay. A uh, little bit of background here. Uh, both Kurt and I teach in, have taught in our executive MBA program. And there was a student in that executive MBA program who, at least in my class and I think he, in your class too, he sort of sat down front and he was very interested. This is the guy that was a co-author on this, on, this, on this paper, and he worked for Syngenta, still does. Okay, so um, I'll make this as quick as I can here. Um, corn is a big deal in the Midwest, and in particular in Iowa. Uh, what we're dealing with here is the production of what's called seed corn. Seed corn, that's the Basically, basically, production of the seeds that are going to be sold to farmers. They will plant those seeds and create these big fields of corn that we see around the state. Okay, so what's the big deal about seed corn? What's, what's important here? Um, 
First of all, uh, pr to produce seed corn, you need two varieties. Um, you know, you, you've got, it's, it's basically a cross between this um, parent and this parent in the field. And the way that happens is the time the, you, you plant what's called male and female corn, it gets a little racy here, but you got male corn, you got female corn. They're planted at the same time, they grow up, and at some point they start to get these tassels at the top of the corn. And one of the favorite things for kids in the Midwest, a way to make money, is to hire on with the seed companies where it's called detasseling. And what you do is you go out in the field and you've got these rows of female corn, you take the tassels off so they don't self-pollinate. You leave the tassels on the male corn so it, you know, it will then, you know, it, it um, that, that uh, stuff falls in on the, on the female corn, on the ears of corn, and that, that creates, creates the hybrid. Okay, that's how it gets produced. Now, keep in mind that you're producing in Iowa in the summer, let's say this last summer, to meet a market next spring. So there's a very long lead time. You know, it's not like you can just in time the production of seed. You, it's, there's at least a, a 12 month process between when you plant your product or try to plant your product and produce your product and then sell it out here. So you got demand uncertainty, you've got yield uncertainty in, in what you grow in Iowa. By yield, I mean, you get a hailstorm and that can wipe out, you know, your field of, uh, of the seed, you're trying to produce a seed corn. Okay, so that's, that's enough of a problem trying to figure out what the production target should be here to meet this because of the, of the yield uncertainty and the demand uncertainty. Well, the seed companies have come up with sort of a neat uh, hedging strategy. Uh, what they do is they plant, you know, in the Midwest to try to produce a particular hybrid. And keep in mind, there are multiple hybrids. There are all kinds of, you know, their, their product line is huge. They'll, they'll plant in the Midwest to, to produce. And then what they do is they have sort of a what if or in case strategy that they can then produce what, in what is our winter or late fall, they can produce in South America because of course our winter is South America's summer. And so what they can do is plant down there or produce down there and then take that result that's down there and, and add it to whatever was made in the Midwest and then they've got the hybrid grown. So you've got, you, what you ba basically have is two opportunities. Uh, the, the, you've got the more expensive backup process in South America. And so what you wanna do is figure out, well, what's the best strategy? Realizing I've got uncertainty here, I've got uncertainty in South America, which is more expensive, and then I've got demand uncertainty. Well, so what we ended up doing and working with, with uh, Mr. Kegler, because he could get you know, some information for us, some, from da some data for us, what we ended up doing is, is developing this production, uh, you know, production optimization problem with two stages, of, actually three stages of uncertainty. Um, it was a fun project, because actually we could demonstrate that if they had used this, they would have lost some here and gained some here, but overall would have, it was a net positive for me had they done that. So, and what I mean by had they done this, we had the results of what they did and the information that they had and the outcome that they got. We took their, basically their input that they used when they made their decisions without the algorithm, put it into our algorithm, and then what we do is we compared it. And as usual with any problem under uncertainty, you win some and you lose some, but the idea is to, on average, do better because they do a lot of this, do this over a lot of different hybrids. Um, anyway, that was a great project. Uh, it turned into a couple of publications for us. It was uh, a finalist in the Edelman competition in early 2000, which was great because 
you know, that, that was good for Syngenta. It was certainly good for uh, our work here. I mean, that was with Phil Jones and, and Greg Kegler and Rodney Traub, who used to be on our, our faculty here. And most recently, we wrote a case about this, a case that can be used in the classroom. And we were recently awarded the winner of the case competition. So, you know, lots of good things came out of that project. And, you know, I, I, think, I think back through the things that I've done and the work that I've done, and a couple of things pop up as most important or most fun for me. And that was one of them. That was, that was one of them. So could you talk a little bit about the historical importance of your papers? Well, how do we measure importance? I don't know. Here's what I, here's what I think. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick sort of, sort of two areas here. One is the, the work in location theory. Um, as I mentioned, Dick Francis, uh, and as I said, I've done a lot of work with Dick over the years. He's been really good to work with. I think our work, that early work on, uh, I mean, continuing work actually on, on location theory has, has really um, helped a lot of young people that are sort of coming through the, coming through the, uh, you know, went through their career. Um, one of the things that, one of the, you know, frequently cited papers for Dick and I, at least, is we wrote a, a survey paper on location on networks that appeared. It was a two-part, two-part, part one, part two, in, in management science. This would have been in the, in the 70s, I guess, that's frequently cited because, you know, it sort of lays out what the problem areas are in this uh, network location stuff. And then I think the convexity yeah. papers has helped a lot of people as well. Um, I, second, I think the second thing that I would cite here is, uh, in terms of if I look at that influence stuff, would be the work in uh, agribusiness. Mostly what I'm talking about here would be that corn problem. Well, okay, so I sort of made a decision several years ago. I thought, you know, I live right in the middle of all of this stuff, this agribusiness. You know, why, why am I thinking about manufacturing so much about manufacturing? Why do I think about an area, a problem areas around me, and that's ag? So what I did is I, I was a senior author, a senior editor on uh, manufacturing and service operations management journal, which was one of the new journals that popped up several years ago. And I was asked to do what, would you like to do a special edition of the journal? I thought, sure, why don't I do something that's going to get people excited about doing research in agribusiness? You know, I mean, agribusiness, I mean, it's been around a long time, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, planting things and harvesting things, and it's been around a long time, but I think it's been pretty much neglected by, until a few years ago, by operations research. I think everybody was running off and doing things with manufacturing, and here, here's an area that could really use some help. So what I did is I, 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 I co-edited this, uh, this special issue, wrote, uh, you know, sort of a, the first paper in there was a call for research. <laughs> Basically what it was is, look, we need to get our act together and get some work done in, in agribusiness. And then, of course, I, I invited some people to, co to contribute to this special issue. I think that that thing, in terms of influence, is, has, there's been a lot of influence on that. Because now, it never, never was the case before, but now in, the, in, our, in our national meetings, there are several sessions on agribusiness. There are a lot of people working on it. A lot of people cite that appeal that call for research that's the first paper in that in that journal so i would say those two things are the primary things um, that i feel are, uh, have an influence so over the years you've had a lot of involvement with professional associations in particular informs could you please talk about some of the roles that you've held yeah i mean i uh, you know i've been involved in some of the uh commit you know the national meeting, um, planning committees, uh, 
when I was in Florida, it was in Miami. I think of both of them were in Miami that I helped with, which isn't a bad place to go for a meeting. Um, you know, as a contributed papers chair or some task at the sort of at the at the top of the food chain for that uh, for that conference. Um, Nicholson, I was on the Nicholson Prize uh, Committee, um, um, the committee to choose uh, fellows, um, the fellow uh, selection committee, I was on that. Uh, a, a couple of other things. I think one of the, not, not that many, quite frankly, uh, but uh, I worked with the um, visiting lecturer program. I was chaired that for a while. That's the one where, you know, the informs ba basically will help to pay for the, the cost, expenses of somebody that's one on their panel they will go out and give a seminar at, at a school. The idea there is to stir up interest in operations research in places that may not have emphasized it too much. The one I'm really most proud of and I think spent a lot of time on it is the, there's this committee called the Expository Writing Committee. Um, I felt that we should be rewarding people. We should be rewarding people that are good writers, that are clear writers. If you publish a paper and it's got some really good results in it, but if people can't read it because you're a terrible writer, then it doesn't have much value except to those people who don't mind filling in some gaps because something wasn't said here that should have been said here. So I thought it was important to start encouraging people to be better writers because I think we're all better off. I think our, I think operations research is better off because there's still a lot of people that don't quite know what we do. But if we're better at explaining it to begin with, uh, that can't hurt. So I chaired that I think a, a couple of times, two, two different times, and I really pressed on the importance of that. And we. That's, a, that's an award that continues, still continues. Um, it's named now the Saul Gas Award because uh, Saul was one of the early, early on um, uh, awardees and everybody felt that he was a good enough writer. We'll just name this after him. So you have a very long teaching career. Uh, do you have any observations or insights on uh, the pedagogy of operations research? Yes, I think we're, <laughs> I think back about how I used to teach a course. Of course, technology has changed a lot, right? Used to, I used to write a lot on the chalkboard and then if I used an overhead projector, I'd handwrite my transparencies and my handwriting is not good. So that was really bad for the students. I think the technology has helped us a lot. Um, also, I think that people are using cases more, which I sort of turned the corner on that. I, I used to think that was, that was unnecessary. Um, I think when I first went to the business school at Cranert and all these people were using cases, I was thinking, what? Why are they doing this? Why don't they just go to the board and start writing things down? Well, after I started using cases for a while, I finally figured, hey, that's not a bad idea because it gets people interested in what you're doing. It plugs them in. So, yeah, I think there's more of that now. I think that's helped us. I think the analytics stuff has helped us. You know, now we got to, now we can say, well, we don't disregard the term operations research, but if we say business analytics, that is more, in, more information for people because that's been in the newspaper. Operations research hasn't been much in the newspaper. So I think that's, I think that's how I see sort of it evolving over time. So we've talked about uh, sort of the cornerstones of teaching, research, and service. Um, are there any other interests you have you'd like to talk about uh, outside the normal classroom activities? Sure. A couple of things. Um, first one is I teach a short course with a colleague at the University of Pittsburgh on project management. It's a two-day short course for practicing project managers. With this thing, I'll make it very quick. We got this started one time. We were at a national meeting, um, this, my colleague from Pittsburgh and I. We, we were in grad school together, and we were talking one time. We said, you know, we, we both like teaching in exec programs. 
it'd be fun if we could do something sort of outside of what we normally do in the university. So we put together this short course on project management and uh, we've now, it's been a very popular program. We've taught that, we counted them up the other day. It's a two day course, 110 times, something like that, that we've taught that course over 20 years and it continues on. So that's fun. The market is Eh, turned down a little bit on our program, but we, we'll continue to do it. Uh, we've done it in many places around the country, uh, many different companies we've done it. I, well, I shouldn't say many, if that sounds like a, you know, a whole list. Probably five or six different businesses that we've been to to teach that course, and it, and it goes well. Because these are practicing project managers, and we bring in software, uh, Microsoft Project, it's, it's one of their Microsoft company has built a project management software. We use that in the class and show them how it works. Okay, other than that, <laughs> uh, this is something, uh, a hobby that, that Kurt and I both share, and that's working on uh, and rebuilding and fixing classical cars, sports cars. So I, um, in my lifetime, I've had a, an MGA, a 1957 MGA that I eventually gave to our son. I now have an Austin Healey, a 1962 Austin Healey. These are British sports cars that I work on all the time, love to work on them. And I also recently got a, a, an old Corvette that I like and I work on. But you know what I like? It's a good hobby because what I like about it is, you know, you're using this all day when you're sitting at your desk. When I go there, I mean, I have to think about things when I'm restoring them, but a lot of it is physical. So, you know, it just makes a good, it makes a good break from what I normally do. And I love to go down to the garage um, and fix the car. Actually, sometimes I look forward to something breaking. Can you believe this? <laughs> well, you don't have to wait too long with the British cars. <laughs> good point. That's true. That's true. So uh, we're nearing the end uh, of this interview and I've yeah. uh, just got a few wrap-up questions. Sure. Um, how would you like to be remembered? Okay, I'd like to be remembered as someone who uh, has done careful work, uh, good work, and careful work. Be careful about what I publish. I've had a few issues where things haven't not intentionally, but uh, a few situations where things have sort of slipped by me, that, and I, I regret that, publishing something that wasn't uh, not quite right. Um, and I don't need to go into that, by the way, uh, except to say that I try not to do that. So I, I like you know, solid work, being careful about that. And then also, as someone who would be, a, is a good mentor, I think that's what, people like Kurt and I should be doing now. I, I'm, you know, I'm emeritus. I've retired, I'm retired from my position here at Iowa, but I still am here. I still go to work here. Um, a good mentor for young faculty and also for young, uh, uh, new uh, PhD students, working with young people, trying to bring them through the system as, and trying to teach them the, what I think is the right way to do it. So can you talk a bit about how the field of OR has developed uh, throughout your career? Well, I've sort of touched on that already, but you know, I think that the, the development business is there's more, uh, you know, there's more influence now with computer science, which I think is good. I think we have to be careful and make sure that we keep our hands in all of this, you know, because, I mean, I'm not saying that other areas shouldn't be making claims about things, but I think to, for our own, you know, for our own future, we got to make sure that we're, you know, we're making people know that, you know, where a lot of this stuff is coming from, is coming from the old operations research community. So evolution, chalkboards, handwritten, transparencies to PowerPoint to computer demonstrations to getting kids getting students on computers 
So what do you think is the most valid criticism of OR, and how would you respond to that criticism? I also sort of <laughs> answered that too. I think writing, I think that the communication stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, in the classroom, the courses we teach, we've got to motivate uh, and not teach by a student looking at our back because we're writing on the board, which you don't do and I don't do. I think there are still people, some people that may do that. So in the classroom communication and certainly in our writing, um, that's what we've got to do, I think. So last Continue question. Continue to do it. Continue to do it, yeah. Um, if you had a smart student uh, who was interested in OR, uh, what would you tell them to uh, specialize in or what would you suggest as a direction they might head into? Okay, one of the things I, I guess, I mean, I can always tell them, you know, here's, here's something that you should work on, but I'm not going to do that. What I would do is I would point out that there, just any area you look at, there, there are problems there. There are existing problems there, and there's some value of digging in yourself, right, and going after it. Um, and I think that's what I would do. I think I would say, look, every area, every area, everything that we look at, everything that we can think about has issues. Nothing's perfect yet. So. Um, there's an opportunity in all these areas, and you got What you got to do is you got to pick something you're interested in that you're going to live with for a while, because that's that's important. Because you you start studying in an area, and and then a year later you find you don't really want to do that. You wasted some time. All right, Tim, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. I, I really I, I feel very honored to have done this. I, I appreciate the time you've spent, and uh, and thank you.